Today we welcome Monica Lee. Monica Lee is a NASA scientist who is serving as the Assistant Vice President of Cybersecurity Enablement at the Federal Reserve Bank. She is the former Chief of Staff of Johnson Space Center, where she was the third highest ranked woman at the Space Center. Monica has worked over 3,000 hours in NASA's Mission Control Center, operating the International Space Station. And for years, she traveled to Russia, managing space contracts valued at over $4.4 billion, the largest international contract in the NASA agency. She is a published research scientist whose works can be found among the Harvard and Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Monica is adamant about little girls seeing themselves as scientists, engineers, astronauts, and whatever else they dare to dream. Because her faith is firm, she believes that in God, there are no impossibilities. V fam, join us as we welcome Monica Lee. Lord, everybody praise the Lord. If I'd have known this is how y'all doing it down in the valley, this is what y'all do every Sunday in the valley. Listen, I started looking at my candle like I think I can come here at least once a month, get me a little something, something. I felt the love of this family when I pulled into the parking lot. When I stepped out of the car and the driver helped me with my bags, I said, well, Jesus, what's this about Chicago? Come through, Chicago. The women were so kind and loving. The men were men and gentlemen. And I said, oh, well, come on now, Lord. This is where I'm supposed to be. It says this is the place where we exist to love God. Not only do you exist to love God, but you exude the love of God. And I say thank you. It started with, uh, let me see, Letitia, Sheila, Thad, and then Nellie this morning. It gets greater and greater, and we're going higher and higher and higher. So I'm going to just say thank you for allowing me the privilege and the honor to stand in this sacred space. Pastor Shalon mentioned that we'd be honoring Pastor Beverly Wilson on her 70th birthday. And, and when I met her this morning, I kept saying, well, well where, Pastor, where Pastor Wilson at? Because somebody said, well, somebody's 70th birthday, that's not her. <laughs> 70 where, okay? There's something in this water in Chicago. I've said that six times this morning. Such a sweet, powerful, beautiful woman of God. Before I get into my message, and I promise I'm not going to be before you long, I want to talk about this number 70. Some folks have mentioned some things, but let me talk about it in Jewish tradition. Numbers have a meaning in Jewish tradition. For example, 70 was the key to creation of the Jewish people. In the book of Exodus, it is written that all who were direct descendants of Jacob were 70 souls. There were 69 family members, don't miss this, and God was the 70th as a demonstration that he could not be separated from his people. So 70 represents completion. In Numbers, 70 elders were assembled by Moses on God's command to write every word of his teaching. And then Moses translated those teachings into 70 languages because it wasn't enough that the word of God be understood by just Israel, but it had to be shared by all 70 nations in their own language, and that is clarity. And in Matthew, Jesus tells Peter to forgive people 70 times seven, which means unlimited. 
Because forgiving as the Lord forgives you is the covenant. Luke 6 says, forgiven you will be forgiven. And that is a completion of the promise. So bless you, woman of God. May your days be filled with wholeness, clarity, and the completed works of the Lord. Amen. Give her a hand. And now I've got to thank my sister and my friend, Pastor Shalon Beatty, for, for entrusting me with this sacred moment to stand on this holy platform to share that word which God has given. I pray that this will leaven in your journey, that it gives you a fresh perspective on the power of your praise and the wealth of your worship. I pray that women are empowered and men are encouraged and families are united as there is a word from the Lord. But before we go there, let me go to our Father in prayer. Lord of Lord, King of Kings, stir up the gifts. Let your people be blessed. Let them not leave here how they came. Let the broken be made whole. The confused get clarity. Unite us, O oh God. Bring families together. Let mothers be mothers and fathers be fathers and children be children. There is an order to this kingdom thing. And you've laid out the plan. It's clear. We follow your word. We believe your word. We trust your word. We lay it all on the altar, Lord God. Have your way. We entrust this moment to your care. Holy Spirit, fill us. Let us leave here with a worship in our spirit that will carry us through the days and the weeks and the years and the generations. We are sowing on good soil here today. And we say thank you. We worship you, we adore you, we magnify you in the name of Jesus. Amen. The word of God is taken from John 4. And in John 4, a conversation occurs between Jesus and a woman of Samaria. Now, I have heard this story many, 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 many times, but something happened when I studied it this time. I said, Lord, this could happen today. These people, these things, these conversations, but let's get into why this story is so notable. First of all, Samaritans were considered low class, less than, not enough. And the Messiah in all of his holiness to some people should not have been associating with them. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Or those people. You know the world can outcast and write off and look down their noses and make you feel like you are inferior. And she was a woman. And in that time, women had no privilege. So again, this Samaritan woman, by the ways of the world, should have never engaged in that conversation with that man at that time. You know, since we're in March, and I know Pastor Ray Beatty being the astute and profound ball player that he is. <laughs> now he say I'm preaching. Now I'm preaching. Okay. <laughs> Pastor Ray, he's all about March Madness. And you know, March Madness is called March Madness because anything can happen. Did y'all see that South Carolina, Tennessee women's game where Tennessee thought the game was over? And all the people in the stands were cheering on, and they was all happy and doing the dance. I saw a mama of number 20 high-fiving somebody, and the South Carolina coach just looked. And the South Carolina players looked at the clock, and they say, it ain't over. 
Then at about three, two, one seconds, right at the buzzer, she shot a three point. And then it was over. <laughs> somebody gonna get that on the way home. Cause somebody been told that your time is out, it's too late. We ain't got enough, you ain't got enough. They already won, it just ain't for you. But it's March Madness and it's maddening. And so don't leave here how you came, cause it ain't over. March Madness where the bottom seed can find themselves in a game and it's flowing and players are at the right place at the right time. And even though the odds are against them, society has bet that they are gonna lose and people are already celebrating that they have lost. Oh, that's only happened to me. That's okay, that's okay. Let me tell you, no matter what the season looks like, no matter where you come from, in March Madness, anything can happen. And madness can become gladness and the bottom can become the top because God has the final say so. And he can set things up in a way so that your enemies looking all confused and silly like they are, just like in the final four, an underdog can win. And you turn around and you look at your enemies and you say, thanks for the lift, because God says he'll make your enemies your footstool. <laughs> okay, okay, and in John 4, even a Samaritan woman at the well can win it all. John 4, beginning at verse 1, and I'm not going to read the whole verse of some of this. I'm going to paraphrase because this story got me so excited. I just got to share it how God gave it. But when you get home, read it. 1 through 42. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, there they go talking, huh? It really wasn't Jesus, y'all, but it was his disciples. So he left Judea and he parted for Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. He came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's, uh, Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired from the walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone to the village to buy food. The woman was surprised that Jesus was talking to her because Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied to her, if you only knew the gift God has for you and to whom you were speaking, you would ask me and I would give you living water. The woman said, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. You know how we can be. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think that you were greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals have enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them. Please, sir, give me this water. <laughs> then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water, she says. He tells her, go get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you right. You don't have a husband. You have had five. 
and you are not married to the man you are with right now. Messy, messy, messy. He tells her, yeah, you said the truth. Can't you see that happening today? <laughs> uh, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. <laughs> so tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it's here at Mount Gershom? where our ancestors worshiped. And Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, as a matter of fact, the time is now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. Tell your neighbor, worship him that way. And if I was in my old Baptist church where I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, if I were the pastor at the podium for the day, I would say, and the title of this sermon is, worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in spirit. And the truth, the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Hmm. So, of course, then the disciples come back from the village, buying their food, missed all of it, right? Where they were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, why are you talking to her, what you doing, what you want to do with her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. All my business, he knew it all. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. See, God will use anybody to talk about his goodness. In the meantime, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. And Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. The disciples asked each other, did someone bring him food while we was gone? <laughs> and Jesus replied, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God, he who sent me for finishing this work. And many Samaritans believed in Jesus because that woman said, he told me everything I ever did. That's the truth. They begged and Jesus stayed in the village for two more days and the people said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard ourselves. Now we know indeed he is the savior of the world. This is the word of Lord. Thanks be to God. Through this Samaritan woman, we see that Jesus comes for the least of us, the outcast of society. And when he calls out her stuff, he demonstrates that no matter our circumstance, we can go to him. And none of that matters. Pastor Shalon and I were eating over dinner last night and we talked about bad theology. And how so many of us have been taught that we can't come to God, we can't come to the church, we can't kneel on our knees, we can't trust our Father because we have messed up so bad and it's just no way he will hear us. That is a bold-faced lie from the pit of hell and may it return. God wants your truth and he can handle that. <laughs> No matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what your regret, your mistake, your fault is, he wants 
all of that. We can go to him. None of that matters. What matters is how we worship. And in this story, he teaches that it doesn't even matter where you worship, but come to the house and worship with other believers. Let me tell you that. And you must worship in spirit and, and in truth. Worship him that way. As I cogitated over the context of this message and I studied the scripture, God lit a fire in me when I read those four words. Worship him that way. When mama tells you to make up your bed and tuck the sheets and put the pillows on top of it, she says do it that way. When daddy says when you drive my car. Park it way in the back of the parking lot. Don't bring my car back on empty. Act like you got some sense and gratitude. Drive my car that way. Words leave no ambiguity or confusion about what to do or how to do it. In the scripture, God says, worship me in spirit and in truth that way. And in that way, hermeneutically, spirit means communal with God. Because God is spirit. And truth means just the way you are because he already knows anyway. We already learned from the Samaritan woman. Worship in spirit and in truth. And that way means to acknowledge the awe of God. His might, his power, his holiness in truth without pretense or preparation. You don't have to come perfect before him. But you do have to be real that way. <laughs> now, because I am a physicist, it is my nature to understand on a nuclear level. Allow me to stimulate your neuroplasticity. Because I am a Christian and a scientist, I can see how science and religion converge. And I understand that science doesn't dispel the truth about God's existence, but rather it irrefutably proves it. In chemistry, when you are formulating conditions for a certain outcome, you must take very specific elements and combine them in a way that will result in the byproduct that produces the outcome you are intending. So I have to put a very certain something in to get a very certain something In a chemical reaction, if I take, if the, if the sound can help me with my, with my slide, if, if I take hydrogen, a very specific element, and then I take oxygen, and I balance them that way, I can create, that's the balance, I can create, next slide, water. Two very specific elements in a very specific way gives you a substance that is required to live. And if I take, next slide, sodium, and I combine it with this next slide, chloride, and I balance them this way, then I get salt. Y'all know salt. Your mama already taught you it ails, it'll heal what ails you. You got a, a sore tooth, what you gonna do? Put a little warm salt water on it. <laughs> your muscles hurt, you don't need no massage. Save them $300. Put your little warm salt water. You'll be all right. 
Thank you. And now in John 4, Jesus says, worship me in spirit and in truth. And throughout the scripture, the end result, the byproduct of spirit and truth, praise and worship is that things begin to happen in the unseen realm. Pastor, if this blow up your tape, I'm going to get you another one. Don't worry about it. It'll probably be all right. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> so in this equation of spirit and truth, this clear substance is spirit. It has no defects. It's pure. You see right through it. It's no confusion. It is what it is. It ain't what it ain't. And when you take spirit and you add it to the equation something happens. Let me tell you about a story. I was working at NASA. I was the chief of staff for them people. <laughs> and there was a woman in the office of the center director who had been there for 30, 40, 50 years. I don't know. And then I show up with my brown self, a female, probably 30, 40 years younger than her. And now she works for me. And she not all right with that, cause she was Tennessee State. She was determined she was gonna win and get me out of there because I only laughed in it when it was funny and I only bowed to God. <laughs> and only bowed to God. So because I act like I didn't understand her equation that she was running this thing, When I tell you she raised complete and utter Hades day in and day out for me in that job. And I said, Lord, is this a test? Because she, she wasn't even the admin. She was like a scheduler. Admins help you. They lift up the mission and get stuff done. I don't even know what her title was. I just feel like she had been there 40 years. They had just left her there for 40 years and handed her over to me. That's what I feel like. And I wrestled with how do I handle and deal with this, Lord, because I'm here for work. I've got stuff to do. And I ain't trying to go down in the gutter with her. I can't. I have to protect my brand. I can't react like what's top of mind for my react. I got to react how I've been trained in the kingdom to react. So I'm not a, a morning person. I don't want to do, I don't want to talk to nobody before 10. I don't do anything before 10. That's just not how it works in corporate America. But do know until 9.59, I am not happy about any conversation I have had. So God wakes me up, no alarm, no noise, no sound, at 4.30 a.m. one Thursday morning. He says, get dressed and go into the office. Do what now? <laughs> go into the office. Okay, so I get dressed begrudgingly, but I do it because there's nobody but God talking to me at 4.30 in the morning. And he says, go and anoint this space.
And I, from my childhood years, I know how to pray. I know how to worship. And I understand how to worship him that way. So I had to get real. Lord, this is so hard. I don't want to do this. These people, why you got me? I could be doing, are you serious? Is this really what you have for me? This how you going to do me? Okay. So I walk in and I take this little baby jar of Vaseline because I think the olive oil on the door handle is going to be too slick for them. They're not going to be ready for that. <laughs> so I get my little jar of Vaseline and I drive up on site. It's all dark still. And I walk into that office, and I say, Lord, you are holy, you are righteous, you are magnificent, you are all powerful, you are my father, you are my king, you are my savior, you are my redeemer. And this song comes up in my spirit, and it's something like, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. So I take a little bit of that Vaseline and I go to my boss's office and I put a little bit on the door and I say, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. And then I go to the next door and I say, this is how I fight my battles. Mm. And then something starts changing. This is how I fight my battles. And I put some more Vaseline on the next door. And I cover every door in that office. And I keep hearing, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. <laughs> Somebody going to go in their office tomorrow. This is how I fight my battles. And that person that's been pushing every button you've got. And that boss that feels like he just keeps doing this. He makes you feel like you can't do nothing right. This is how I fight my battles. Because you're going to remember today you learned when you worship him, worship him that way. And things change. And so then my boss that day, and I'm going to where and I'm going quickly, said, um, do you want to go to lunch? He never ate lunch outside of his little three-man crew. Some, somebody will get that later. And I said, yeah, I want to go to lunch. Let's talk. We have lunch, and then he's asking me, how are things going? Now, I can tell him the truth, truth. Or I can sit and listen to what God says. Now, I could have complained for 35 minutes, but what the Holy Spirit said to me was ask him, what can I ask God for, for you? So while I thought I was greasing up them doors for her, I was greasing up those doors for me. Because sometimes you can't change the masses, but you can change the moment. And he said, pray for my children that they are okay. Okay, never met your kids. You never talk about your kids, but you are entrusting this moment with me and my God and your children. What I later found out, just weeks later, he had just been diagnosed with stage four cancer. And had I taken that moment to dwell on what was broken in my world, I would have missed the moment that God designed, that woman got on my nerves all that time for me to sit at that table with that man after that diagnosis to pray for those children and that family to bring him peace when I was worried about mine. But God says, I've got you. 
And then I get back to my office and I said, well, what just happened? And, and I hear in my spirit, God is doing a great work. He's doing a great work. God is doing a great work in me. Get you a worship in your spirit. It don't have to sound good. It don't have to be on key. It don't have to be on beat. God wants that too. So when you're walking around huffing and puffing, this orange balloon is whatever the problem that ails you. Whoever she is, whatever he did, whatever they talking about, what they doing, this is it right here. And you trying to attack it with your carnal mind. And God saying, I have told you what to do with that. Come to me, worship me in spirit and in truth. The truth is, this is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. It hurts. It's lonely. They stabbed me in the back. They disappointed me. Wait, I disappointed me. Tell your truth. I need somebody to hold this mic. I'm all out of breath with this orange balloon up here trying to do this thing on my own. The truth is I need some help. Thank you, Pastor Ray. And so in the equation of spirit, get your husband, get your husband. I mean, of spirit, the truth of the spirit and truth, what happens is when we're trying to work and God's already said, worship me that way. Because things happen in the supernatural where you think you're trying to work and fight and do one thing and I'm already doing it on your behalf. You say, you are right. You might not be all right. Thank you, Pastor Ray. <laughs> when spirit and truth come together, you maximize your intimacy, intimacy with God. And when you worship him that way, miracles manifest and conversations are had on your behalf. And the underdog can become the favorite. And what your enemy thought would take you out would lift you up. When you worship him that way, you become the favorite. Dry valleys are made fertile. And when you worship him that way, that thing that you were looking at with no hope suddenly seems like a slam dunk. When you worship him that way, you forget what it looks like. You won't fall for the tricks of the enemy because you know who you are and you know whose you are. And like that woman of Samaria, no matter what the people say, no matter what culture says, regardless of what you've done, irrespective of what society projects on you, you worship him that way and you get what God has promised. God, right now in this moment, forgive us for suffering like fools when you've already given us the victory. Whew. From this moment on, our worship has one purpose, and that is to please you. We will forget about all that we've taken on because we thought we had to be fixed right before we offered you our praise because somebody lied to us for 30 long years. We know you want our truth, and the truth is without you, we can do nothing. But with you, all things are possible. God, in this moment, we ask that whatever door you want to open, let it open and let no man be able to close it including us. And God, any door that you want closed, let
let it stay closed. And let no man be able to open it, including us. That's a boxed in prayer. Y'all ever heard one of them before? God, forgive us for our subconscious digestion. Looking at what we see with our natural eye and swallowing it as truth. We know that when we worship in spirit and in truth, miracles and wonders will happen. Circumstances will change because we followed the formula. And your word never fails. You have a calling on your life. Each one of us. God will show us glimpses of the end. You know, sometimes through dreams and and visions, sometimes through conversations, sometimes through acts of whatever, and sometimes it's through your desires because God will give you what to want. That is him giving you the desires of your heart. Give you what to want in your heart and in your spirit. But, but, He does not show you exactly how you will get there. Between the end and where you are is called the plan. The plan is the process to get you to your destination. He doesn't reveal the plan because if you saw what you had to go through to be prepared, Some of us will say, uh, 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 that's all right. I'm good. Because we don't understand the power of what will come once it's manifested. In as early as elementary school, I knew my destiny was based in science and mathematics. Because I used to take things apart, try to put them back together. My parents gave me the space and the freedom. I didn't say they weren't annoyed. And my mama didn't say, look, girl, put that lamp back when you get done. But I was always drawn to it, and I have always had an affinity for math and science. But God didn't give me a full glimpse of what this story would be. Can you imagine? That's what's called a test of faith. When God gives you something to do, but not the whole plan to do it. Don't you wish he would just give you the whole thing up front? Listen, I am, by academia, a rocket scientist. There were no rocket scientists on my block in my hood. I couldn't emulate the scientists next door. Uh, My teachers didn't encourage me to go fly rockets. They ain't even know to do that. But whose fault is that? Nobody's. Because I don't need that encouragement to do what God told me to do. (laughs) There weren't a tribe of women waiting to welcome me in NASA. There are even fewer black and, dare I say, just people teaching me how to do this thing making it easier for me to navigate in this male-dominated society. If I look back, matter of fact, I remember my fifth grade teacher told my parents, I talk too much and my math skills would hold me back. Can you imagine a teacher projecting over the future of somebody's child who ain't theirs, what they will and will not do, what they can and can't do? That's what happens when they talk. (laughs) When they talk about what they do not know. (laughs) Listen, the power of life and death is in your tongue. Speak over yourself. Tell yourself I am more than a conqueror. Tell yourself I am the head and not the tail. Tell yourself I am above and not beneath. Tell yourself I am the lender and not the borrower. Tell yourself I am the righteousness of God. You are what you consistently show up to be. And at that age, I didn't know anything about trials and tribulations. All I I knew was that 
my mom and my dad instilled in me that I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And what I knew was that Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God says, I, have, I know the plans I have for you, plans for to prosper you. That's what I knew. And see, back then, my worship just sounded like, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. In life, it's like we find ourselves handling pieces of a puzzle without the picture on the box to tell us what the end's going to be. And these pieces, when you pick them up, y'all ever did a puzzle box before? The pieces, when you take them out one by one, they look awkward and misshapen. And, and then we try and place them, and they don't seem to immediately fit where we think they should. So we put one down, we pick one up. We try this thing, we try that thing. We start, we stop. Because we can't figure out if it's cut wrong. Can't be right. I can't figure it out. But the thing is, it only looks strange until you find where it fits. And once you discover where the misshapen pieces fit, then it makes sense and you come to realize that the pieces of the puzzle indeed create a picture intentionally and perfectly designed. Everything you've encountered Every good, every bad, everything you understood, didn't understand, agreed with, disagreed with. It's a puzzle on your life's journey. It's a piece of that puzzle. And you just got to figure out how it fits in. That crazy lady on my job was just a piece of this puzzle. And I thought it led to a conversation with my boss who could do a thing to move her. But it did a thing to move me. to pray for him and to pray for his family, even when I didn't know what or why I was obedient. And God, you've taught me to pray, so I know how to pray. And I know you can move some things. When that teacher spoke that way over my life, she didn't see me through the lens of my creator. Look at your life through the lens of that puzzle. All those and pieces are created for your victory because God says all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord. She didn't see 10-year-old me at the age of 20. Because by that time, I was sitting in NASA's Mission Control Center being paid to talk and do mathematics. Always the people with no abracadabra trying to tell you what to do with your magic. <laughs> My mother taught us not to be confined by anyone's limited perceptions of us, but to trust God and to trust his word that he had a future and a hope. And I don't need to know the plan because God said some things I will keep in my secret place. She sits when I walk in these rooms and they tell me, you don't look like a, a what? I don't look like a rocket scientist. That you don't know what a rocket scientist looks like because God said some things he would keep in the secret place. And when you see a hidden figure, she been secret too long. There are some things God has had to wait until the right season to give me because if I would have gotten it too soon, I would have messed it up. If I would have gotten it before my appointed time, I wouldn't have been ready. Some things had to be put on hold. Some yeses had to remain no's. Some I had to be strong enough to receive. 
old enough to understand and tired enough to let go. Sometimes what appears to be your circle is actually your cell. And the people in that circle, they ain't your friends, they your cellmates. I'm going to stop because I want y'all to invite me back. But the only reason y'all are close is because you chained to some same habits. Break the habits y'all are attached to and you don't have nothing in common. God wants to give you everything you thought you had no business dreaming of. He said he could give you more than you could ever ask or think. Now, after getting what you prayed for and a little bit extra, because that's just how God works, pray for the discipline to keep it and the wisdom to multiply it. God has told you to be encouraged, have faith, and do not grow weary while doing well. The word of God didn't say the weapon wouldn't form, The word says the weapon formed against you would not prosper. Some people mad at you, listen, because you were not suffering the way they expected you to. May God keep on disappointing them. And we get tired, and if you hang it on by a thread, just make sure that thread is attached to the hem of his garment. Trust God's work and his resurrecting power. Walk the walk God gave you. Speak over your children what God told you to prophesy over them. They are whole, they are healed. They will not have a childhood they have to recover from. Speak into fruition the life that God placed in your heart to live. Understand your currency of faith and your rights as an heir to the kingdom. You remember the story in Mark 5, wherever Jesus walked, there were crowds following him. And there in their scripture was a woman who had bled for 12 years. She spent all she had going from doctor to doctor, getting, trying to get better, but she got worse. But when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in that crowd and she reached and said, if I can just, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I can be healed. And when she touched him, The bleeding stopped immediately. And then Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, who touched me? Now, y'all know he already knew who that was. But he done already told you, come to me in truth. You going to speak up? And the disciples said, all these people out here, how are we supposed to know who touched you? And Jesus looked around again and he said, who touched me? And the woman fell at his feet, trembling with fear and told him her whole truth. Remember, worship him that way. 
And Jesus said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And he did it immediately. I've seen too many victories to let defeat have the last say so. God has made a way too many times for me not to trust him one more time. Remember the story of Ruth and Ruth left her hometown to follow her mother-in-law to a strange land? Y'all remember that? Her mother-in-law had nothing to offer except how to build a relationship with her God. And her mother-in-law tried to convince her, girl, stay here with your people. My son is gone. I'm not even technically your mother-in-law still, but they ain't talk about that part. But stay with your people in this familiar land. And Ruth said, no, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. So Ruth worked in these fields that was owned by this man, Boaz. And by working, I meant she just picked up the scraps from the people. One day, Boaz visits the field, and he asks the worker, who, who that is? <laughs> who is this woman? And they say, she followed that old lady here. And she works sun up to sundown, picking up scraps. So Boaz goes to her and says, hey, hey, hey. Don't work on nobody else's land. Stay on my land. Wherever the men go, and the women, that's where you go. You work and follow the ladies. I've told them not to lay a hand on you. And when you get thirsty, go drink. See, some people like to talk about this thing called imposter syndrome, where we struggle with, do I belong here? Can I fit in? Am I good enough? Not a single one of you in this house will feel that ever again. And let me tell you why, because you know this secret. It must be hidden deep, 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 deep in the word, because I just, I don't know, not, not enough of us remember or believe this. But the Bible says, the heart of the king rests in the hand of God. So whatever room I'm in, my daddy already went and laid it on the heart of the king that said, that's her, pick her. And whatever table I find myself sitting at, God's already pulled the chair out for me. He's prepared the place because the heart of the man who owns the land and pays the people, God's already told him, that's your one right there. So not only did Boaz make this arrangement with Ruth, but he fell in love. And he marries her. And then they have a son named Obed, and he has a son named Jesse, who is the father of David. The same David that defeated Goliath and became the father of Solomon. And like Ruth, may your generations be blessed. And like Ruth, from this day on, let there be no more lack. And like Ruth, stop picking up scraps. Get what you deserve. What's your rightful heir? Because somebody is going to obey God about you. in your life comes alive call it out right now call it out right now God I speak over the children protect them oh God give them wisdom and discernment speak over marriages right now 
We bind the enemy. We tie up your hands, Satan. Leave your families alone. Single mothers, you ain't single. God's got you. Single fathers, God's got you. Daddy, show up for your children. Affirm your daughters. Teach your boys how to be men. May your devotion to Jesus be strong like Mary Magdalene on Resurrection Sunday. That you going back to the tomb because somebody said it dead and over. And she said, I just need to see him. But you witnessed the burial. What you going? I need to see him, dead or alive. I need to see him. Crucifix, death or no, I need to see him. And the report says Mary stood near the tomb crying and she cried. And she bent down and she looked and she saw two angels dressed in white seated at the, at the seat of the, the tomb. And one at the head and one at the foot. And the angels asked the woman, why are you crying? She says, they have taken my Lord and I don't know where they put him. And as soon as she said this thing, she turned around. Somebody was standing there. And that, that someone said, woman, what you crying for? What you looking for? And she assumed it was the gardener. And she says, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. That's some faith right there. In response to her deep-seated devotion, her worship. She turned and asked him in Aramaic, Ribuni, which means teacher. And he looked and she knew that was her savior. Sometimes you're in a dark place and you think you've been buried, but you've actually been planted. It's time to push your way through the crowd. Activate the power of your praise. Like the woman that made her way with a 12 long year issue of blood. Understand the wealth of your worship. Don't leave here today without worshiping him that way. Get you a worship song down in your spirit. Get you a hallelujah. Get you a Lord, I praise you. Get you a Lord, I love you. It will change over time. It will mature over time. And you'll go from, oh, how I love Jesus to, I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Oh, somebody understands. Worship him that way. Come on, y'all. I love you, Jesus. <laughs> I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. We just worship you. Oh, there is none like you, oh God. You are King of kings and you are Lord of lords and you are holy and righteous and your word is pure and it's true. And we just thank you. God, I need you to take over. Less of me and more of you, oh God. Every day, every night, I just want to praise you. I just want to worship you. Have your way, oh God, so that the things of my heart are the things of your heart. Let me do the work that you have called me to do. Let me touch the people that you put in my path so they can come to know you in a real way. God, we worship you, we adore you, we magnify your name. Somebody 
hasn't had an intimate moment like this in far too long. Take your time. Let him dwell among us. Thank you for 70 strong years, oh God. Thank you for an example of who and what we should be. Thank you for accepting us just as we are. Thank you for planting us in the valley where we can grow. Thank you for honorable leaders who walk in integrity and in truth. Thank you that your yes is yes and your no is no, God, and we can trust you for everything that we are and everything that we will be. We commit our lives back to you this moment because I love you more than anything. And I just want to serve you. I just want to praise you. I just want my worship to be like I'm grabbing your ear and kissing your cheek. It's got to be that intimate. It's got to be that real. I'm not going to leave here the way I came. I trust you, God. I'm yours, Lord. Do what you want to do. Do how you want to do it. And I will forever worship you that way. Praise the Lord. Come on, church.